Hello and welcome to Full Disclosure, a podcast project conceived exclusively to let me spend more time than I'd ever get on the radio with fascinating people. Um, Mary Beard, welcome. Nice to be here. Well, it's lovely to have you here. Uh, Classicist, broadcaster, best-selling author, dame. I mean, it's... Where do we begin? <laughs> Sounds like a pantomime character. <laughs> oh, no, it, it? doesn't. <laughs> um, well, we, we'll begin at the beginning. I, I, uh, Mum was a headmistress, I yeah. think. So yeah. the, the academia was writ large from the get-go. Yeah, she was the village schoolmistress in the village that I grew up and she later went on to be head of a bigger junior school. But she wasn't pushy, though. Hmm. I mean, I'm sure there was a, there was a bit of teacherly instinct um, coming out, but I never really noticed it. And I've been books everywhere, presumably. Yeah, yeah. And my dad was an architect, and you know he was, you know, he was full of art books and architecture books, and you know, yeah, it was a house that was full of books. Were, were you? I mean, in the village, as as the as the head mistress's daughter, would there be a level of scrutiny that other children wouldn't have from their <laughs> peers? You see, I didn't notice you know <laughs> so i i kind of put down a lot of this to my parents being quite good actually yes, yes. because when you say it, it's kind of obvious isn't it that um you know there was aspirations i was my dad had a child son from his previous marriage but i was an only child effectively and you know the story you'd write now is that you know a lot of investment in me um lot of pressure but it didn't feel like it. And, you know, so I suppose that's one thing I should really thank them for, yeah, isn't it? They kept you insulated from yeah, that. Yeah, I just I didn't, and, you know, maybe I was dim. I didn't notice it. It was just get, get, go on with getting on with it. Did you attend the school that your mother ran? I did. Right. Uh, but then I think probably sensibly she said that when I was seven, because it was a tiny village yeah. school, you know, it's you couldn't avoid her. And, you know, she did say, I remember her saying to me that, you know, she other kids had a bad day at school and then they went home and yes. mum and dad didn't know. Yes, yes. But, you know, there was a kind of spillover that she thought wasn't a very good idea. So when I was seven, I moved to a school in Shrewsbury. OK. And did you enjoy it? Did you like school? Yes, mm. I think so. I, th- I mean, I don't think I was a... I wasn't at that stage a kind of terribly keeny swat. Were you not? You didn't. You didn't. Spe- what did? You, what were you keen on? What did you like rather than sort of sticking your head in books? Um, I liked a lot of things I wasn't very good at. Really, you know, games, and you know, I wanted to be the person who could run the fastest. You? you know, dream on. I'm afraid, <laughs> dream on. Um, and and at what point did did it become clear that you may you may have been of above average intelligence? <laughs> I don't know because I would I would never have put it in that way. I I was bumped up a year. Okay, well there you so go. So yeah. that's when uh, sort of eleven or twelve. Where, yeah, I oh. went into the senior school a oh. year early. Okay. You know, I'm not sh- I, I'm not sure that was wholly a good idea. No. You know, because for social development, for social things. You know, I was very much the youngest, mm. and um, you know, everybody else was you know blossoming into or regretting being, you know, whatever you have, you put a, a teenager and I was still, you know, sure, a kid. a little girl. L- yeah. Did you find making friends easy? Pretty much, you know, and it was, it was an all girls school and it was, it was quite girly and clubbable mm. and, um, you know, I, th- I think the fact that I don't remember huge amounts about it is because it was all fine and yeah. taken for granted and normal and you know I don't bear any scars no. at least not ones that I notice <laughs> you know maybe I do you know so <laughs> when you say that you would think maybe <laughs> I'm terribly scarred yeah. but it doesn't feel like it and that's what counts for me and and similarly from from home because you have described your dad as a is it raffish or raffish well I Raffish, I've raffish. Raffish. A, a raffish. bit feckless, a bit feckless. Yes, public schoolboy type and a complete wastrel, but very raffish. engaging. Yes. What does that mean? It means that he had a kind of sense that was a bit contrary to the work ethic. <laughs> <laughs> I think. You know, 
was, you know, an architect. He was quite a talented one. He worked in historic buildings. That's what he liked to do. But he also liked long lunches and right. not doing much work in the afternoon. Yes, should have been a journalist. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I, he wouldn't survive now, <laughs> that's for sure. You know. Um, uh, so, so, so I see that. So that's said with affection, really, and not with yes. any sense of sort no. of this, uh, being let down or, or no. anything like that. No. So it was, it was a loving home. You were loved. Yeah. Yeah, they got divorced in right. the end. So, you know, there's a, <laughs> there's a, a sense in which, there, you know, some love must have been lacking at some point yes. higher up the food chain. But but I, I, I felt supported. I didn't feel pressed. Um, uh, I felt that people were on my side. That's you know? nice, isn't it? And, yeah. and no sense that because you were a girl or, or a young woman that some doors were closed to you. That, that never occurred. I... I, I think I was unobservant, you know. Okay. But but I was <laughs> I was at a girl all girls school, um, and I think that I hadn't noticed that doors were closed oh. until I went to university. Right now, and I'm not sure whether I'm pleased about that or not. I think in in one way, I think by the time I got to university, I was ready to deal with that. Mm. And the fact that I'd not noticed it before was prob could be to the good. I also think maybe had I experienced uh, directly and noticed, you know, the sexism around when I was 16, 17, you know, I might have learnt different tactics. But mm -hmm. what I felt was when I, when I met sexism, you know, and I did in Cambridge, you know, yeah. um, I kind of thought it was a bit odd, uh, you know. I thought, yes. what, what are they going on about? I, right. So I was puzzled by it. I wasn't afflicted by it. That's interesting. So I think single-sex schools probably do girls a lot more good than boys. Oh, I was. It certainly worked for me. Mm. I don't think it worked for my daughter. Um, Did it but, not? But um, it worked for me, and I'm, I'm pleased, and grateful, and. I think it sort of, I found it easier when I was at university to be kind of resilient because yeah. I did think that um, all this stuff that perhaps there were things that women couldn't do, just, I thought it was, I thought that was very silly. It's a great word, silly, it is. isn't it? Because, I mean, it is very silly. It is very silly. <laughs> and you kind of, you think, actually, laughing at it yes. was quite a good response. Uh, yeah, yeah. I suppose, you know, I think... I, you know, I'd read quite a lot. I'd read quite a lot of feminism uh, when I was in the sixth form, um, and my mum was a very, a very feisty feminist. Mm. But I, I seem to remember thinking it was all a bit theoretical. I was really interested in it. Okay. But I didn't think that there were people out there who wanted to stop me. Now, I was wrong, sure. you know, but it, it wasn't a bad start. Yeah, so the struggle wasn't real, really, until it was. Until it, was. it was intellectual, you yeah, know, it yes, was a thinking yes. about, so, you know, thinking about women's position in the world was an intellectual problem. It wasn't um, about my own career. I see. And that that would I mean people who've discovered you through television and and through your work as a as a classicist and historian may not be familiar with your work in the field of feminism. You you, you right. haven't just read books about it. You've written books about I it. Yeah, of I course, have, I yeah. have. Um, I, I I've written one book about feminism with an eye on the classical past. Of course, but um, that was very much. You know, that was a nice opportunity to reflect. Yes, to reflect on. Things that I were, was had become to see mm. were much more practical. Now, I, I, you know, there was a learning curve when I got to university, and uh, you know, I, I did start to see um, the ways that women were, you know, were kept in one particular place. Mm. You know, and I, I was reading classics. It was very, uh, you know, it's a very linguistic subject. You know, and I remember when the kind of penny first dropped that. The word ambitious was a bad word if said about a woman uh -huh. and a good word if said about a man. Of course, because it means pushy, in, pushy. in the female. In, yeah, yeah. And it means going places. Driven in the male, male. doesn't it? Hell, yeah. hell, yes, of course. And so I came into, I suddenly realised that actually embedded in the language that people spoke was was a way of 
of treating men and women very differently. And knowing your place. Yeah. Even subconsciously. Yeah. It's a sort of yeah. power yeah. of language, isn't it? We jumped ahead a little bit. I want to know when you started excelling at school. <laughs> because you got into the sort of fast track Oxbridge set yeah. that you've spoken about quite fondly. I, I found uh, Latin and Greek very exciting. I also found I was good at it. Okay. And I think when you're in your early teens... Um, there is a pleasure in being good at something. Yes. And and then you become better at it yeah. because you invest more, yes. um, because you want to shine at it, and then you shine more. But I think it was... So there, there was a, you know, like, you know, it's a confession. That it was it was because I, I liked being good in that way. But I, there was also an excitement about the ancient world, which came not actually through reading great classical texts. It came through thinking about archaeology and you know, just thinking about the... I mean, and I still feel this, you know, the sheer excitement of being able to touch the past. Yes. It's, you know, I it's wonderful. I can't imagine ever not being excited. But when did that first blossom then? When did that... Where did you... Because I know you did some archaeological excavations yeah. during the school holidays, which is not yeah. a normal pastime. No. Really, oh, well, you wouldn't be able to do it now. No. But, you know, back in the day, yes. you know, teenagers were allowed to go and wreck, wreck archaeological sites. <laughs> you know, but it it started when I was very little. Did it? I mean, uh, and it, it, I, you know, I know exactly. I mean, I know, and I can still remember in my head um, the exact moment when it started, which was um, when I was five. Right. And my mum had taken me to London for the first time and we went to the British Museum. And I was kind of, I wasn't keen on the Greeks and Romans and didn't know who they were, but I was keen on the Egyptians because right. everybody's keen on yeah, mummies, yeah, aren't they? Yeah. And she took me to the uh, Egyptian everyday life room and she pointed out the back of a case, there is a piece of Egyptian cake, it's 3,000 years old. Blimey, you know, and I wanted to see it, of, of course. course yeah. uh, and back then, museums were not at all child friendly, and the cases are very high. She'd got bags, she tried to lift me up so I could see this damn bit of cake, and we were struggling. And a guy walked past, uh, and he said, Was I looking, trying to look at something in particular? I said, Get that bit of cake, mate, you know. <laughs> and he must have been a curator because he got a key out of his pocket. He opened the case and he brought out the piece of cake. And that was a, that was well, magical. Mar- it was it? magical. Yeah. It was magical. I mean, it was magical partly because it was the excitement of mm. being, you know, eyeball to eyeball with the piece of Egyptian cake. Yes. But also he kind of demonstrated something that people will, you know, people will open cases for yeah. you. Yeah. People will open up the past. You know, it was a real... God. A real kind of learning experience, and that backstage sense as well, as in, you know, being party to something that, that not yes, everybody else was that's party right. to. That's that. partly that. I yes, think. that's lovely. You know, and but I think that you know, if there's one person I've got to thank for my career, I don't know who he was. No. Um, you know, he taught me about that excitement, and he also taught me to open cases for other people. I think was yes. yeah, you know, I yeah. thought that was, um, and that kind of continued because I was. I suppose my mum and dad took me to castles and things mm. like that. But when I got to be a, a, a mid teenager, you know, it was it was still the moment when kids could go and spend their weekends um, excavating Roman villas. So you'd write to someone, would you? And or, or you just t- I mean I can't remember how it first no. started, but yeah, you, I must have I must have written an application, and it must have been advertised in the local art centre. And, and, and up you turned, and up I turned, and it was, and of course it turned out to be fantastic because um, not only was it this this you know nobody has touched this piece of pottery since 300 AD and I'm now touching it yeah. it was that kind of excitement also I have to confess there was a sort of you know there was a sort of sex drugs and rock and roll aspect to it that this sure. was away from mum and dad very nice mm. but you know going to you know camp out sometimes you know in the middle of a you know, horribly wet muddy field but um, you know with a whole load of other people, 
who you shared know, your enthusiasm? Shared your the enthusiasm, passions. but also shared kind of you know they all you know shared a kind of in, interest in popular culture, of course, as yes, well, and possibly each other, and, as well. and possibly <laughs> each other. And uh, you know, my mum and dad thought it was wonderful because it was you know so cerebral. So, yeah, it mm. was, it was the, what was Mary doing? Yes. Well, Mary was spending her summer <laughs> on an archaeological excavation, right? <laughs> Mary thought she was doing that, but she was also going down the pub and a lot of other things, you know. And so it was it was a kind of I suppose if it, if it taught me anything it taught me that you could have fun yes you could have fun doing what was um in some ways very cerebral yes and and that you didn't have to compartmentalize your life no you could have no. fun at the same time not yeah, just sort of no, press could. pause and then go off and have that's fun right. you no could. that's right it could all it all could be wonderfully mixed up which together. is you Yes, that's what it is, me. You know, so you know, I hadn't thought about it in those kind of terms before, but yes, I think definitely that's is. That's right. Um, and and then, so by the time you're approaching O levels, the planets are beginning to align. You've developed a passion for yeah. touching the past, and it turns out you have a great facility for speaking the languages yeah. as well. And so, um, you know, I was very lucky. Yes. You know, it came together for me. Um, Why? What was it? Because I mean, they don't go hand in hand necessarily, do they? There's, um, you could easily have found. Latin as dead as dead can be, yeah, and you, you and, and loved archaeology, or you could have yeah, found archaeology yeah, no, ridiculous while being a brilliant classicist. Yeah, yeah, it just, in some ways, in my head, I managed to put it together. Gosh. And, you know, at the time, it seemed utterly obvious. You know, I'm yes. interested in the ancient past. I'm interested in what the ancients wrote, and I'm interested in what they made. Um, but you're right, they're in some ways completely different skills. Mm. Susie Dent was sitting in that chair not long oh, ago. Right. Uh, but who, of course, yes. before her television or alongside television, is a lexicographer and, a, yeah. and a, an etymologist. And she, she was a linguist first, and she yes. discovered German around the same age that yeah. you discovered classics. And she even now describes it as feeling like she'd come home. Yeah. Did yeah. you have that sense? Yeah. Did you have a sort of. I felt, well, I felt very comfortable. Yes. You know? And I think that. Um, you know, it's quite hard. However, um, uh, however decent your mum and dad is, mm. however well you get on at school, it's quite hard to feel comfortable when you're fifteen. Yes, right. Yes, of I course mean, it is. Yes. You know, I mean, but being fifteen is all about not feeling comfortable. Yeah, finding actually. your place in the world. And and, uh, and there was that bit that I was doing that I felt very comfortable in. And and as you say, that then feeds into itself because you're good at it. You work harder at yes, it, and you become right. better that's at right. it. You're almost yeah. polishing your skills, aren't you? Yeah. Honing, honing. I, I think I think that's right, and I think that you can see how it could easily go wrong. Yes, you know. I'm struck by this sort of sliding doors element of it as well. That if you know, if you hadn't studied classics, lots of schools less so then no. perhaps, but, no, but you know, certainly there were schools no, that wouldn't right. have studied it, or or, right. or, or your no, mum hadn't right. taken you to the British that's Museum right. that know, day. It's no, that's right. And you think you look at all these happenstances along the way. Yes, of course. And, and you're now a trustee of the British Museum. Yes, that's it's, kind of... Um, that's rather lovely. That is a sort of irony, isn't it's it? Right. It's you beautiful know. symmetry, I think, <laughs> yeah, rather than... Yes. Um, so then, presumably, by the time you're doing your A-levels, the, the, the prospect of going to Cambridge or, or Oxford is is fairly large, writ fairly yeah. large in your and, rooms. And I was very obedient at that mm. point. Um, uh, perhaps uncharacteristically obedient. And I had a... Classics teachers, very um, uh, austere, mm. actually, a kind of a bit of a parody of a classics teacher, <laughs> but terribly supportive, you know. And she'd been to Newnham in Cambridge, right. you know, a long while ago, <laughs> and she said, I think Newnham for you. Mm. Now, I did have a little kind of flicker of disobedience. Right. And it was just the very beginning when some colleges were offering places male colleges or offering places to women right and i said maybe i should go to maybe i could apply to kings which mm. was one of the colleges doing that and they said i think you know would be better for you now at this point you know i just thought i'll go with the flow beard i think yes and yes. i was very pleased I mean, actually i was very pleased i did good yeah. why what was it that when you got there? And, oh, and was it, I mean, I, I sense you're too modest to probably confirm this, but was it a foregone conclusion that you would get in? Didn't feel like that to me. No, I know, but was it? Um, 
What was very funny was that once I got a job at Newnham much later, one of the things I did was go and look at my application (laughs) form and the references. That's a different form of archaeology, isn't it? (laughs) (laughs) And what were they? What did you find? I mean, obviously, they were were quite flattering, but it didn't look like a done deal to me when I read this. It said, she's uh, the only child of elderly parents. Gosh. I thought... That's a bit of a downer, isn't it? <laughs> and you'd never thought of yourself as no, that. I'd never thought of myself as that. No. Yeah. Gosh. But it's very funny. Um, and you settle right in. Are you? Would you already, if, if I'd met you at that time, would you already have been thinking about a career in academia? Would it, or, or would that not have entered your head? Um, what I wanted to do, because I, I remember saying this to the principal of Newnham uh, at one of these kind of these you know, principal meets the mm. freshers meeting and she always remembered it said <laughs> I'd like to work in adult education okay and I wanted to um, uh, you know actually be involved in what we would now call continuing education we wouldn't call it adult education um, you know and I, 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 I thought there was just such kind of wonderful possibilities of bringing um, intelligent people, but n- not not within education currently, yes. into the study of the ancient world, uh, and I suppose I suppose I did that in a way yeah, later. Yes. Um, You're an evangelist, aren't you? Yeah, I want to I want to say, look, this is really interesting. You know, I let, want you to feel what I feel. Yes, or at least to know what I feel. Yes, and. Um, and we, if you don't feel it, we can have a good talk about it. You know? <laughs> yes. And it, it probably would be a bit awful if everybody in the ancient, everybody in the modern world thought that the ancient world was really interesting. But, well, it would, it would, it would, it would increase the competition, Mary. It would, wouldn't it? <laughs> yes. yes. But and maybe you, it'd be a bit dull, James. But, but, just a bit yes. Dull. But do you struggle to understand somebody not being mass transported by that ancient cake? Do you do you think how could you not feel that or see that and and feel? That sense of I, transportation. I, I struggle a bit, mm. um, and I, I sort of don't believe them entirely. I mean, <laughs> I, I mean, because it can take you very many different ways, and I would not want, you know, I do not want the whole of the country to have to learn Latin and Greek. Mm. You know, I'm not a, I'm not a Stalinist no, in that sense, no. remotely, and I think you should. You know, let many flowers bloom, for heaven's sake. But I think if you, I mean, I think the kind of absolute acme moment was being um, in Pompeii, and there was a wooden cradle that had held a tiny little baby's skeleton, and that had been destroyed in the eruption mm. in '79, and uh, they let me rock it, and. You know, and I think, I don't think I know anybody yeah. who wouldn't think that there was a little tinge of excitement sure. in that. A portal. Yes, in some ways, in some ways. Um, no, I don't, you know, I think we can be excited by all kinds of things of and course. not want to spend yeah. our life doing them. Um, but l- let me let me help you be excited. And did the... Uh, possibility of spending your entire life doing it begin to flower during your first degree at, at, at Newnham? Yeah, and I, I got very interested in it. There were some really charismatic teachers. Mm. I, mean, um, I had some great women teachers at Newnham, you know, who were pretty savvy about the way, you know, I was now beginning to see that the world wasn't quite as equal as I thought it was. Yeah. And they were very good at helping me navigate that. And it was a time when the ancient world, and I suppose it's always doing this, but uh, it was changing. Well, you know, now, I think it's very easy to think that my time was the time it changed. Well, I'm sure 40 years ago, people would have, think that, would have thought that too. But mm. um, I remember we were, we were actually, or my teachers were changing the kind of things that you studied. And, you know, we were studying really for the first time ancient slavery. Right. And it was, so there was an image that, you know, uh, that people often have, I think, now of, of traditional classics yes. as being only about posh men in togas. 
uh, usually massacring some unfortunate barbarians, <laughs> you know. And already in my day, it wasn't like that. You know, and I remember vividly, you know, thinking about slaves and women and uh, how the economy of the Roman world worked, that kind of thing, which it somehow it felt new. Mm. You know? it, now, I don't know whether it was new, well, but it, it felt it was, new. There weren't books about it, were there? No, no, no so, very few. All very few. So you're, it's odd, isn't it, to think that you can be a pioneer of studying the past? Yeah. Because the past has been there for so yeah. long. But it's always changing. <laughs> of course it know? is. And, and, and I, 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 more modern history changing a lot at the moment. Yeah. You know, the p yeah. people are getting very cross yes. about the suggestion that perhaps there are yeah. periods and processes yeah, we right. could study rather differently. Yeah. Um, I, so I, I, I sense that you were in in Clover then. You were just loving every minute of it. Yeah, it was, it, it was great. Yeah. You know, and also, you know, it was back then, and I'm afraid students now haven't got this privilege, you know. But then I had a grant. I didn't have to worry about money. Mm. Um, actually, I decided that I wanted to do not a three-year course in classics, but four years because I wanted to put, put a particular combination of papers together. And I got a grant for a fourth year. Yeah. And I was pleased to do that, but I didn't think it was particularly surprising. Oh, and we, we, we were so privileged. You know, we could... I remember my... Um, my teacher saying the first time we met her, uh, you uh, and just it, this is out of another world now. You are paid by the taxpayer yes. to do a degree, and that means forty hours a week work, forty eight weeks a year. And and she was a bit of a socialist, as you can see underneath that, as yeah. well as being a bit kind of yeah. terrifying, and. You couldn't say that to a group of students now. You no. couldn't say you are paid by the taxpayer. To, they're not. No, and 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 it also recognises the the value of of learning for learning's sake. Think, well, or, or at least what it gives it, to a society. That's right, and it recognises the sense of obligation. You know, if you're being, mm -hmm. if public yeah. money is supporting you, you have to do what you're supposed to do. Mm. Right? Tell me a little more about encountering sexism for the first few times how did it <laughs> uh, it was surprising yes. uh, uh, one of the moments that, that I shan't ever forget uh, and I won't mention the name of the person because I'm still a friend of his uh, he came <laughs> into my visited me in my very messy college room and uh, he started to kind of help me clear up you know um, sort of slightly takeover -y way and he picked up one of my essays that had been marked and it he, he looked at the end and he said and he read it out it mm. said this essay is very good it really is it will get a first class mark and he turned to me and said you get a first and I thought the only reason that you're saying that the only reason is that I'm a woman. You know, there's, you know, you have no idea what I do. No. So it's just that kind of your expectations of me, and not my expectations of myself. And and your expectations of yourself were undimmed by these. Yeah, I experiences. And, you know, that is where the fact that you know it 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 did seem to me silly. It seemed to me that you know by that stage. I had got a bit of iron in the soul when I met it. Mm. Um, I didn't feel outraged by it. I thought, that's just wrong. And that silly. Is, that is silly yes. and wrong. <laughs> and look, I'll and show I'm you, not mate. going to waste any bandwidth dealing with this. No. I'm just going to crack on with doing yes, what I do. I think that's... Did you encounter it in the faculty? Did it, did it, did it pop um, up there? It did in all kinds of ways. It's mostly kind of micro-sexism, mm. actually. Um, unconscious. Yeah, often. And, uh, yeah, often unconscious. Mm. I mean, it wasn't... Um, the, you know, there weren't um, whole areas that women were excluded from or not encouraged to take part in. Mm. But I do remember being taught when I was a graduate student by uh, an extremely charming man. And I eventually realised we were learning about Re Greek and Roman inscriptions. And after a few weeks, I realised that 
he would go around the group and ask them different questions. Um, and he always asked me an easy one. <laughs> and I thought, he's asking me an easy one because he doesn't think that I'm up to a difficult one. Gosh. <laughs> well, that's almost chivalrous. That's what we mean by, by micro sex. So he's not trying to embarrass you. He's no. looking after you no. in his own That's right. In way, his own his terms, own he was wanting to be nice. It's interesting that there's a mirror here of what you said about the nature of the classics changing because, of course, that was changing as well. The, 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 yeah. the whole feminism yes, movement right. was changing yeah. and men yeah. like that were not bad men, but they were becoming yeah. increasingly anachronistic. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think that... I think I never thought they were bad. No. I think I thought they were wrong. Yes. And I think there's a hell of a difference between being wrong and being bad. Gosh, yes. And we forget that sometimes, yeah. increasingly, don't we, yeah. in this sort of yeah. no, very right. loud society that that's we inhabit right. now. Um, and then as you, you you go straight on to your PhD, I think, yeah. after your first yeah. degree. So now you're thinking of a career in academia. Yeah. And I was, I was extremely lucky because um, I got invited to do a seminar in London. I was doing my PhD in Cambridge. Um, and... It went down rather well. What was it? On? It was on the sexual status of Vestal Virgins. Fantastic. It's, oh, it's can, got the lot. It's even got and, alliteration, hasn't it? It's, it's <laughs> got the lot. It has absolutely the lot. And, you know, let me confess, it was a kind of slightly flirtatious subject. You know, here we've got yes. this, you know, ox, you know, Oxbridge PhD student. And do you know what she's coming to talk to mm. us about? Sexual status of Vestal Virgins. So flirtatious might be the wrong word. It was just a little bit naughty. Yes. Um, but I just at that point got into anthropology and I'd been reading loads of things like Mary Douglas's Purity and Danger. And I thought, you could put this together Gosh, with yes, this. Yes. And it was at the time when people were just becoming receptive to that. So, you know, it kind of went down well and it got published. And then there was a job in London, in Latin literature, which is not exactly my strongest suit, but right. never mind. And I got it. And um, that was tremendous because um, I didn't expect to get it. And so when you don't expect to get a job, mm. you do um, s sort of go along and you've got nothing to lose. And you can, you get the job because you don't think you've got anything to lose. And then uh, when it's just a lovely kind of landing. It is. And I remember, uh, and it's a piece of advice I give to everybody now, I thought, what can I wear for the interview? And I was really surprised to get an interview. And I thought, I know, they will think that I'm a real blue stocking. So I am going to wear blue tights so they know that I already know that they think I'm a blue stocking, right? Yes. And that was really good fun. And, uh, and I, I still remember it was a very formal room and I still remember kind of giving answers to questions that were just, you know, you'd have thought would be absolute killers. I remember someone saying, doesn't Professor X uh, think, or whatever mm. we talk about, I said... Isn't Professor X dead? <laughs> and, and then they they said, no, no, I think he's still alive. And I said, oh, there's a lot of people alive in Cambridge who you think must be dead. No, what a way of failing to get a job that was. But I got it, you know, partly because I, it was I was being real. Yeah, but I was about to say there's an authenticity there, but yeah. also a fearlessness. But I yeah. think, as you just explained, the fearlessness might have come from the sense of having nothing to lose. Nothing if you'd been lose. desperately wanted the job God, and thought yeah. you were in with a brilliant chance of getting yes. it, you'd have yeah. been self-censoring. Yeah. And it was, you know, it was tremendous. I'd only done two years of my PhD. I was 24, you know, and I got a permanent job. This is 1979, I think. Yeah. And you, this is this is lecturing yeah. in classics yeah. at King's. Yeah. So did did you have another moment, like, like the uh, Egyptian cake moment, when you first stood in front of a room full of students? Did yeah, you I not? think... I, I, I don't think I was very good at it no. to start with. Because uh, I think, like a lot of young academics, I probably overprepared. Yes. And I also, I wasn't very good at putting myself in the position of the audience. Oh, you know? really? Yes. I think what I did when I look back was I thought, what do I want to say to them? Instead of thinking, what might it be useful for them to hear? All right. And so I think that I was quite a bit anal. Um, 
And it took me quite a long time to find that a different sort of voice. And, well, authenticity again. Yeah, really. It and it, it it was marked in part by an encounter with a, a senior male professor who later became a colleague. And I wanted to show him an article that I'd written. And, you know, when you show an, a, a draft of an academic article, you say to the person you're giving it to, I want you, to, I really want your criticisms. That's, of course, a lie. You, you want, don't. You want you praise. Want, you want you love. Want praise. <laughs> you want praise. So we went, we went to go over, after he'd read it, we went to the Pizza Express opposite the British Museum, yes. you know, um, and drank quite a lot of wine. And then in the end, we went through the article a bit. And then he said, the trouble is, Mary, it's right, but it's boring. Oh, God. And Ooh. yeah, that was boring. I mean, you could take many things. You could take being boring, wrong, but being boring. boring. No. But I, I think that I have more to thank that guy for than anything, because I thought, I'm not damn well going to be boring. And I was doing the same kind of thing. I was thinking what I wanted to say, mm. not how I would interest people in what I had to offer. So it's a combination of art and craft then, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And yeah. so and so it was, so I thought, I'm ne never, ever, ever again is someone going to say that what I've written is boring. I just got an image of if, if you ever see an actor after a show and they ask you what you thought, that, you're not supposed to tell them the truth, are no, you? Not. Just, no, you're not. No, not. You're not. <laughs> and we go through all these motions yes. of asking people's opinion when we don't actually want to hear it. You're wonderful, darling. Absolutely <laughs> wonderful. Thank That's you very right. much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so. oh dear. Um, you've also, again, I, 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 you've, t you've touched on the graduate student being the I think you were the only female member of faculty at first when, when I went back to Cambridge was that when you went back to Cambridge when I went well, back let's to not Cambridge. jump ahead because yeah. you you complete your PhD yeah. um a, a couple of years after in three years after starting at, at okay. King's yes because I was doing a full-time job and yes it was so what was it was it was it um an incremental so you would you, you you knew you knew it was going to finish but there are only enough hours in a day and also yeah. you need a degree of mental space you need to space. do hard and it's, work and it's hard yes. you know i was look i was ever so lucky and i'd got a job that they were not going to take away from me mm. after just two years of my phd you know you, know, you say that to a young yeah, to an early career researcher now and they just think you know that's another world um i i think that <sighs> I think again, th this was before the, the you know the boring episode with the uh, with the article, and I think I wrote a I wrote an adequate PhD. Right. That stage, I thought, yeah, you know, I did come to see what I needed. I need to have passed my PhD. Get That's through what it. I needed. Yeah. I didn't need, you know, I didn't need to write, a, you know, the br most brilliant PhD okay. ever. I think it was, and I never published it as such. No. I published bits of it, and it had the title. Uh, you can, you can just, you can, as soon as I tell you, you'll think, oh no. <laughs> um, it was called the, the, the State Religion in the Late Roman Republic, colon, a study based on the works of Cicero. Okay. You know, yeah. and that is what it was. That was, That's, you know, It did exactly what it said on the tin. It did, <laughs> it did. And it, this was before Robert Harris right. had made Cicero sexy. Of course, yes. <laughs> but, but, you, but your academic rigour is... In, was, in place. Now. Yeah, I, I, and there was a certain confidence I had yes. that I could do it and that I could tell a bad argument from a good argument. And um, yeah, there might have been over overconfidence in that, but I, I felt I was doing the job that, that, that I ought to be doing, you know. But the but the I don't know what to call it the communication skills or the evangelism isn't in place yet. No, they came later yes. and they came gradually, and uh, you know you learn from teaching students. Of course, yes. And you know you'd have to be very dim not to see and not to remember those occasions when you saw their eyes open. And you realise you'd got a point home. Yes. And in some ways, I think it's that experience over several years that, for me, was better than than any, um, you know, training courses course. in how to lecture. It was just finding out, you know, when they thought 
oh no, how long is this going to go on for? You can work? feel it, can't you? You can feel it. I think. You can feel it. Yes. And you learn from that. There's a restlessness in the room, or there yes. can be a ripple going round the yes, room when you've right. when you've connected. Yes, that's right. That's right. You can right. take a breath yes. even. I mean, yeah. it must be magical. Yeah, and you can see you can see puzzlement. Yes. You can see them getting it. Yes. Yes. You know, and so you know, so I got better. I, I you know, I got better quite quickly. Um, but it was uh, by learning on the job. Yes. Now, the student might say. But we had to be the people who, on whose job you learnt, right? I'm sure they wouldn't. I mean, it's, it's really, it's just a recognition that nobody is ever the finished article. You're still no. learning on the job now, I imagine. Yeah. It's a, it's yeah. sort of... You know, learning to do telly was about learning to speak in a different way. Yes, of course. Um, there's a lovely story about you worrying that you may not be able to afford to get your thesis typed up. Yes, yes that was... I, I finished it. And, you know... Again, nobody would understand this because yeah. this was I had written this out longhand, then I'd typed it on something, you know, a corona typewriter <laughs> or whatever they were. But what you then did was you had to have a typist mm. uh, type it all out. And I was I was short of cash. I mean, and my supervisor, when I said to him, and he said, OK, I think you can submit this now. I said, but I don't. I don't have the money to pay for it to be typed. Uh, he went over to his desk, he wrote out a cheque, gave it to me and said, go and get it typed. And I said, but how shall I pay you back? Yes. And he said, you do it for someone else one day. And you have. And I have, yeah. yeah. You fund, you fund. Yeah, I, yeah, I funded it, some scholarships, but... You know, and I think that's, that's absolute... You know, someone saying that to you... Perfect. ...is a real lesson yes yes yeah pay it forward i think pay is the phrase for, the kids pay use. it yeah, forward yeah. that's what they said that's yeah um and then and then two years later to, to you're, you're you're back in cambridge, cambridge. Yeah. was that always the dream i don't think so um there were people in cambridge encouraging me to apply it was a time of of you know quite stringent university cuts yes of course at that point and Cambridge was a bit shielded from that you know I remember that came home very strongly to me when the last meeting I went to Owen King's we'd been discussing uh, what periodicals and journals we were going to cut oh, from gosh, the library yes. the first meeting I went to in Cambridge we were discussing what new periodicals and journals we might take. <laughs> and I thought, right, OK, there is, th there was selfishly a reason for coming. Now, I'd learned a huge amount in King's, actually, and I think that, I think, I don't think it's a good idea to stay around Oxbridge your whole life. No. You know, see a different kind of university. Um, so I have absolutely, um, it's not that I have no regrets about going and teaching in London. I have huge gratitude for what it gave me in in every way, but I was very pleased to to have the resources that Cambridge could offer. Uh, apart from yes, apart from the resources, how would you explain the difference of, of being in that of those two different atmospheres? Well, I don't think actually it's about um, the quality of the students. No. People will often say, "Oh, you must be getting really good students, more better students in Cambridge." Mm. I, you know that. Maybe if you know the distribution was slightly different, mm. but but no, you know that that isn't what it was. I think there was something about being in a classics department, a faculty that was really big. You know that you were um, you you had lots of colleagues, mm. and they had lots of different specialisms. And if you wanted to explore this, there'd be someone there who could help you, and. So I think size was quite important. The idea that there were lots of students and and lots of staff, and you know, resource was you know was an issue. You know, in terms of um, you know, I'd really like to run a seminar on this. Yes, I see. Yes, and none of that comes free. No, so you're back to being like a child in a sweet shop, really, and and, and there are more sweets at yes. Cambridge than there are at other yeah. universities. I, I mean, I think. That is true, or it was true. Yes. Um, I think that, you know, I don't think that everything about Oxbridge is 
desirable. I think not. it has a certain degree of self-satisfaction, <laughs> mm. um, which is not always well placed. Mm. Um, I think it was quite good for me that I was a woman. I was a bit on the out crowd in terms of just the you know, the number of men yes. and. There was a, a period when I was the only female lecturer in the the classics faculty in Cambridge. You'd be conscious of that, and you, were, I, I was conscious yeah. of that. Um, you know, I was. You know, other classicists would call me the woman at Cambridge. Yes. You know, and yes. and but it puts, you know, it makes you want to change things. Well, you've said that. It would be a lie to say that gender has held me back in my career, but it has sometimes been a case of feeling in a foreign country. Yes. So you learn the new languages. You learn a new language, and and I think that I'm I, I've been hugely lucky and hugely privileged, and Cambridge supported my career in a way that I I couldn't have asked for better. Right. I could not have asked for better, but it did it did feel the I mean the the kind of analogy I used. Um, and in fact, I first used it when I was talking to a group of um, British ambassadors, including some women, and the women n instantly knew what I meant. That I felt, I felt I was always living in a hotel. You know, yes. I thought I wasn't actually at home. Oh wow! And and it was a really nice hotel, and I kept sure. getting upgraded. You know, yes. so that I was finally I'd ended up in the penthouse suite, <laughs> okay. and it was lovely. But it's still a hotel. But it was still a hotel. When I told that story to one of my smart colleagues, he said, sometimes people do better when they don't feel at home. And I kind of think there's a point in that. Yes. Yes. Know? I didn't, I because that's where the self-satisfaction comes Creeps from. Creeps in. That's, I'm you know? part of the furniture now. I'm part of the I'm furniture. I'm going to relax. Yeah. Yeah. And you never relax. And if you never quite feel at ease... Um, so we'll, we'll run through some of the different rooms in this hotel then. So <laughs> pr professor in 2004, but, but before that chair of the Faculty of Archaeology, yeah. History and Letters at the British School of Rome. You've yeah. been visiting a professor of classical literature at Berkeley in California. Um, you, 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 what, what, what's the right word for popular? That, that doesn't sound as if it's trivialising. So your lectures on Roman laughter, for example, you're discovering ways to reach parts that other academics that, aren't reaching. That's what I think. I mean, actually, I, I published the lectures I did at Berkeley under the title Roman mm. Laughter, and I don't want to knock this book because I was quite pleased with it, actually. <laughs> but when I see people pick it up at like, a literary festival or something, I think it's actually quite hardcore. You know, yes. It's got a great cartoon on the front, and it's called Roman Laughter. But, but it's and, not a collection of Roman jokes. But it's it's not. There are, at the end, there yeah, are some. Yeah, a funny thing um, happened on the way to the forum. But, <laughs> you know, I, I think the, the fate of most books on laughter is that they're very unfunny, yeah. and I think mine is no, no different. But it, it was a kind of way of thinking, trying to get at what we share with the Romans and mm. what we don't. Mm. And it's very easy to think that laughter is something which is pretty universal. Yes. And and I found it was, you know, you could, it was very hard to pin, pin down Roman laughter. And and it was particularly, the, the thing that puzzled me most and was that I couldn't, I couldn't find the idea any kind of clear sense that the Romans ever smiled. Right? <laughs> now, they must have, they must have yes. in some sense, but the smile didn't have a meaning. Yes. Now, for us, a smile is a hugely important signifier of interpersonal relations. Yes, yes. You know? yes. Um, and I'm sure the Romans turned their, you know, the sides of their mouth up just in the way that we do. But you didn't feel people actually thinking that meant something no. and I thought blimey what would it be like to live in a culture where that for me utterly taken for granted bit of human interaction mm. didn't mean anything mm. so I, I, I thought it was it was interesting and it, it it got a good audience because other people have the same puzzles. And, well, and also you communicated the mystery as well, which yeah, is which is really I hope so. What what who who you are, isn't it? You find the broad, the huge canon, if that's the right word, of of, of ancient Rome 
or of the classical world and you find jumping off points really yeah. throughout your career where yeah. you think I want to really 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 dig into that now yeah. and then yeah. I'll move on to something else yeah. and we approach now the point you're, you're a prolific writer you're a successful academic you, 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 as you say uh, invitations from from all over the world and we approach the point now where you become a public figure of a very different kind yeah. somewhat I suspect to your own enormous surprise Yes. <laughs> I mean, I'm extremely relieved that I didn't do any telly because it's telly that really yes, changes things. Of course. Um, until I was in my mid 50s. Um, because I think that, well, you, you've got to be tough. I think you've got to be tough to do telly because you know, not everybody likes what you do mm. and they can be pretty outspoken in saying it. Well, we, we gloss quickly over one of the first reviews you got from the late AA Gill, Gill. Was, was vile. Yeah, uh, objectively know. vile. Uh, you know, if she's going to put herself in our living room, yes. she might she might do something about her appearance. Yes. You know? Now, interestingly, um, it was vile. Turned out that Gill had sort of misjudged the zeitgeist. Yes, yes. Because it was just when that was turning. And a lot of people thought, you don't say that about a 55-year-old woman who's giving us something quite interesting. And who is clearly brilliant. On the telly. Yes. You know? And so he came out of it worse he than really me. He really did. He really did. Um, Again, a moment, as you say, of, of, yeah. of, of changing yeah. social tides. It was. And, tides. Uh, and I was really surprised, as well as relieved, from the kind of people from whom I got support. Yes. Like, the, you know, I, I did an article for the Daily Mail about it because I thought, um, you know, I could do an article for The Guardian and mm. everybody would agree with me yes, and yes. that would be fine, but it's preaching to the damn choir. Um, let's do it in the Daily Mail. And I looked under the line. I decided when I'd done it, I would look under the line. Um, <laughs> and I thought I was just going to find torrents of yeah. abuse. And, you know, there was some, sure. you know, of course there was some. But mostly, they were on my side. And I thought, actually, the thing that really resonated with them was when I said something like, what do you think a 55-year-old woman looks like? <laughs> she looks like me, actually. <laughs> you know, she doesn't look like someone who's had a load of work done. And there were loads of 55 year old women readers yeah. who saw that they were being attacked not just me we're back to authenticity aren't yeah. we actually yeah. it's, it's much yeah. To, to, yeah you're right A.A. Gill's misjudgment being immense and, and, and Janice Hadlow knowing what she was playing at as well so yeah. she was the controller of BBC Two but perhaps more importantly also a historian yeah. your book Pompeii had, had yeah. kind of pushed the envelope yeah. of your own yeah. career you won the Wolfson Prize, Prize for it yeah. and, and so it's a hit yeah. it's a big yeah. it was a, a hit and she just thinks let's see if we can turn it into a television programme yeah. Yeah, you know, good for her. Yes. And she wanted more women of a certain age on telly, and she wanted more people who were historians doing, you know, presenting what they knew about. To start with, I actually was very reluctant because you know, colleagues of mine had done bits of telly and they'd complained about how long it took and all the rest. And I thought, oh, you know, I don't know if I've got the time for this, yes. you know. Um, Janice was spot on she said i've read stuff you've written where you say it's fine to be a wrinkled crusty old bloke and you get on telly if you're a wrinkly crusty old woman you don't now i am offering you the chance to be on telly yes are you really now going to turn me down isn't that hypocritical it's got you over a barrel really yeah and I go, at that point i thought okay i, I was however extremely prescient because i remember saying do you know i don't think aa gill's going to like this <laughs> really yeah and i thought yeah. right bitch Got it in one, but <laughs> and 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 you you were you were a natural. I mean, you took to it but partly because oh. of everything we've spoken about up to this point. Suddenly coming I, together, it rather it, sort of serendipitously, it, really, in in, in a in a right. in a package. Oh, it did, and I had a lot to learn about yes. about. Not it, nobody ever wanted me to dumb anything down. People think, oh, it must be terribly dumb. No, down. it isn't. Um, People can tell when you're patronising them. Yeah, they can, and but you do have to learn that it's different putting over an idea to, you know, hundreds of thousands, maybe a million or so people mm. when you're standing in front of, a, you know, mm. some bit of Roman stuff, yes, you know, and stuff. you can't see them, right? And you can't <laughs> yes, see them. Of course. You know, it's yes, not like the lecture where you see when when you're landing a point. I, yes, exactly that. Exactly that. And and, 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 and and then you continue, really, just to, to, to pick the bits 
that you find fascinating and dive and dive dive deeper into them which means we should hop skip and jump to oh God, to, to the new book emperor, emperor emperor of rome which, uh, and I, I see it i think as a as a companion piece to spqr yeah. uh, it is partly because uh, emperors didn't get mu- much of looking they got some looking in spqr and that was because spqr was a a history of change. Mm. It was how Rome changed from being, um, you know, a tiny, totally bog standard little city to becoming a world empire, or at least a Western world empire. And the truth was that after the first proper emperor, not Julius Caesar, but Augustus, um, for about 200 years, Things didn't change no, very much. It's bubbled along. You know, they, you know, you could have gone to sleep in <laughs> in fourteen CE, and you could have woken up in two hundred CE, and few things would have been different. But the world around would have been more working in the same way, and that wasn't the case if you looked mm. two centuries before. So that meant that I, I, you know, I had plenty to say about how the culture and society of the empire worked, but emperors. They had their you know, uh, little cameo appearances, mm. but wasn't terribly important. And I thought, what I'd like to do is I'd, I'd like to find a new way, not a new way in terms of what academic study has done, but a new way of putting the emperor in front of the ordinary, intelligent general reader. Mm. Because they are normally fed biographies. Mm. And... Uh, uh, That's fine. You know, I think there's some very good biographies. Friends of mine have written them and I admire them. But I think that it, in some ways it gives a very um, misleading picture of the Roman Empire. That it it suggests that um, in order to understand this, you've got to know the personal idiosyncrasies of Nero followed by the personal idiosyncrasies of Galba or whoever. And... I don't think you do, no. actually. And there was—I found a wonderful quote in the in the Meditations of Marcus Aurelius, the second-century emperor, when he was looking back at his predecessors, and he said, "Look, basically, same play, different cast." And I thought, "Look, why don't I try to write uh, oh, with that as my cue?" And instead of saying, well, we have to know that, you know, after Caligula, there came Claudius, yes. et cetera, et cetera. You know, we don't need to know that. Most people in the Roman Empire didn't know that, for heaven's sake. Um, why don't I think about it thematically? Where did emperors live? What did they eat? Who did they sleep with? How did they rule the Roman world when they had no, com- you know, they had very rudimentary communications? You know, who who served them? Who... who how did they get around the place? How did they travel, right? And, you know, of course they were different one from another and there must have been kind of, you know, lascivious Edward the Seventh types and, you know, dutiful George the Sixth types. But it's so much more important to see that they're doing basically the same job. The job description is the same. And what is it? Let's ask what it is. And I found that just opened up things and Gosh. it opened up evidence that tended to get um, shunted just shunted yeah, you know? yeah. and it also and this is what, what kind of pleased me most in a way was it it didn't ignore the little people in the Roman world mm. because actually through the eyes of the emperor you see them you know they bring their problems to the emperor. They write him begging letters. They put their tricky legal cases to mm. him. And in a funny way, he represents the magnifying lens on the little people. I and mean, it's, you know, it's counterintuitive, but it's in seeing what came into the emperor's entree that we see what ordinary people's problems were. So it's the nature the essence of em- emperoring. Yes. It's an, uh, as, and, you know, one of the things you had to be, and I'm sure it was more an ideology than it was a fact, is you had to be accessible. You know, there's a wonderful story about Hadrian, who's 
riding along the countryside and a woman, elderly woman, comes up and says, excuse me, Emperor, I've got a question to ask you. But <laughs> he said, I really don't have time. Uh, and she says, if you haven't got time for me, you've not got time to be Emperor. <laughs> right? <laughs> Bang to rights and he stops. Love it. So uh, not boring. And so, you know, it's not boring. And, and you can find, if you look in the right places, you know, you find the Emperor's jokes you find the way they respond to these difficult cases I mean, there's old augustus he's sitting there in something like 19 bc and a case comes onto his desk it's about a guy who's got killed by a falling chamber pot <laughs> in the town of Knidos in <laughs> turkey hundreds of miles away That's incredible and so you get these wonderful snapshots of Real life. Mm. Trajan faces mm. the case of a guy who's been trying to prostitute his wife to raise a bit of extra cash, and then somebody refuses to pay him. So he goes to the emperor saying, Excuse me, I'm, I'm owed. And you know, Trajan was a quite wise old bird and did yeah. say, I think, you know, uh, no. <laughs> right? No, in a word. Humanity. Yeah. I mean, it's, a, yeah. it's sort of essence of history, really, isn't yeah. it? Always, and and, and, you, and your relish for it is t as as, as yeah. clear and as big as it was yeah. when you started. Yeah, it is, and you know, and I think in some ways I've got I got a bit savvier, I got a bit better at it. But it's a but you know, it's a bit like what well, hey, you know, what Tom Marcus really says: same play, different cast. I'm doing the sort of same thing, but I'm doing it in different ways. Is he? Uh, this is such a crass question, but I, I'm going to ask it because we're nearly out of time. Is he your favourite? Marcus Aurelius. Yeah. Do you know I'm going to get into terrible Go trouble? On. I am going to get into terrible trouble with this. Marcus Aurelius's meditations, as we call them, um, we don't know what they were yeah. called in antiquity. Um, his kind of series of jottings is a bestseller. Yeah. You know, it is a bestseller. You know, it outsells Beard quite often <laughs> in the Amazon charts, right? And I guess I should be pleased by that. Um, I find it com. Completely overrated. <laughs> and as soon as I say that on any podcast or radio or telly, I you know bombarded. I get bombarded with people who think that it's the you know best thing since you know Socrates. <laughs> and um, but I do think he's interesting. I think meditations, you know, frankly, sure. I, I, well, it's, it's because he's reflective and and uh, you know or, or, or doing philosophy, whereas. I guess we think of most other emperors I as just doing stuff. Yes, I think actually most of them probably did philosophy. Of course, they that's did, what they were yes. trained to do. Absolutely, right? yes. Um, but what I think is interesting, and where Marcus Aurelius comes back on the scene again, is one of the things that people give so little attention to compared with these damn thoughts. Yeah. Um, <laughs> is um, the letters that survive between him when he was a young prince, kind of in his mm. late teens, early 20s, and his tutor, Fronto. Uh, yes. And there you have letters written between the guy who's going to rule the Roman world and his teacher. And they're quite eye-opening. And they, they take you to a sort of ordinary bit unconfident yeah. bloke yeah. who describes his day to his tutor. He's on, he's on holiday with his adopted father, the emperor Antoninus Pius, and they go out hunting, but he's not very good at, he's not no. very good at hunting. Then he gets back and he he sits with his mummy, and he says mummy. Yeah. He sits down with his mummy uh, and have a chat on the couch. Um... Um, then he does a bit of homework. It's incredible. And then he complains about his aches and pains. I've got a terrible pain in my neck, though my foot is better than it was yesterday. But I'm not sure I'm going to eat too much today because my stomach is still a bit delicate. I mean, so fantastic bodily yes. obsession. Yes. And there you see a kind of Marcus Aurelius who's nothing like the Marcus of the meditations. Well, I'm happy to you say. You like him more. Yes, I like him more. <laughs> I like him more. Um, we're, we're, we're out of time. I do, we'd glossed over it. I do want to mention, because you, you've, you've retired from teaching at Cambridge yeah. now, but continue to, to, to keep all your other plates spinning. But I do want to mention the Joyce Reynolds Award, which you have set up, um, named after one of your own tutors that will, will cover the £10,000 a year living costs yeah. of two undergraduates yeah. for the full duration yeah, of their degree yeah. course. Yeah. 
it's it's some um, paying forward, isn't it? It is isn't exactly what we call paying forward. And it is. I, I did it at. I decided to do that in the middle of lockdown. Uh, partly because, you know, rightly, people started to think really hard after the the murder of Floyd. And there was a lot of soul searching. I think productive soul searching in many ways. And um, people in classics looked very hard at how their subject was implicated and yes. what its diversity was. And the answers weren't great, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. to say the least. But in the end, I felt, look, we've done our soul searching now. What this needs, it needs some action. Yes. You know, and action needs cash, right? <laughs> you know, you don't get action without cash. So let's, you know, you know, let's think that we've learned from this, but let's do something. Please, let's do something. So you no. did? Well, and it's only a little bit. Uh, and, you know, in some ways its effect is symbolic rather than, than no, you know, huge. Except for the... Well, except for the people, no. <laughs> um, but it it's showing it's showing that people have noticed. Yes, I think that's the that's yes. the important thing, really. And I've look, classics has been hugely good to me. You know, I've had a life hugely more um, privileged in all kinds of ways than I could than I would ever have predicted. You know, and it's thanks to the Romans, actually, in part. And thanks to an ancient piece of Egyptian cake. Cake actually. was <laughs> thanks to a piece of ancient Egyptian cake. And, you know, it's payback time, guys. Uh, Emperor of Rome is, is out now. Um, Mary Beard, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.